<clears throat> I'm thankful to be able to speak. Uh, it was probably 25 years. Uh, all I could do, I was never able to speak. Uh, I was able to maybe lead a song service from time to time, make the announcements. So I'm thankful that I, can, I have an opportunity to get up and express myself, that we all have uh, this uh, opportunity to do this. The, uh, we would never get up and speak about something that you would commonly find on the earth, things that are native to this, to this situation. We never get up and speak about those things. And we would never get up and talk about things that man can do of themselves, but we would get up and speak about things that God can do things that are on the earth because God has brought them to us and provisions that he has he is, uh, given us. So th these are the things we wouldn't dare get up and speak about anything else but these. Now, men are in no way capable of establishing any kind of absolutes about anything. Uh, they, there's no, they can never come up with any kind of stationary or any kind of concrete principles. Uh, in, in regard to behavior and, and how men should act and things like this, uh, there's no such a thing in this world that uh, for men to do that uh, to come up with any kind of standard for judgment uh, that would uh, as guidance among men because men can't men can't do this because men are themselves are unstable and they're unreliable and unfaithful so they can't they can't come up with a, a standard a permanent st standard so um, we uh, we've been given a divine nature uh, in order that we can do this, and and even still, we we have we have a struggle because uh, of the flesh and because of the world and things of this nature. So, but now our text, we're going to talk about uh, uh, something that uh, Brother Antonio read to us that uh, God brings something into this world that otherwise would not be here. Now, last time we went in Corinthians, our text was like uh, four through. I believe it was like. Uh, uh, four through nine, and I had already prepared tonight's lesson on ten. But after I went back through and did some more study, I said, "You know, uh, I need to go back, and I need to go back to verse nine. So I just put that on hold, and I went back to verse nine because really I didn't do uh, like I should have done on verse nine because I really need to talk about that some more. I, that was a mistake. Now, uh, so I thought I should go back and I should. Uh, deal with this some more. That God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now here we have it said straight out God is faithful. And only two times does Paul say it like this. God is faithful. Period. Both times are found right here in this letter to Corinth and each time he says that it has to do with God's faithfulness to the work of salvation. And God is faithful to do what he is doing. He's faithful to do it and God is faithful to to us, and, and 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 that's how he talks about faithful. When he said he's, God is faithful, now in this world we would have no idea of faithfulness outside of God, like I just talked about. Who would know about faithfulness if it were not for God, the God of this world? He don't know anything about faithful. He's the father of lies and a, mur a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't know a, a, a faithful. Only God, only God, He is faithful. And we can con continue to say that uh, in, in addition to that, all good, the good things that have come into this world, they have flowed from the goodness of God. Amen. And so then how about a God who is faithful, who is also true, who is holy, a God who is love, a, a God who is able, and uh, he's not like this sometimes. Yeah. You don't find him like this sometimes. But he's always this way. Amen. And this is what makes God greater than all, you see. Amen. And uh, in, our, in our minds, we immediately make a contrast of a God like this with the, uh, with the situation we're in. That we have a world of men who are unfaithful. Amen. Right off the bat, the first thing we learn in, in this world is that we can't rely on men. And so Paul tells us right here, God is faithful, period. No clarification needed. He doesn't go into an exposition of it. He, Paul's, he says, uh, God, He is faithful 
in that he called us and put us into Christ Jesus his son now if we just take that verse that uh, phrase out of that verse I like to do that and from time to time just take that out of there and just look at it God is faithful and uh, we looked at it by itself so to speak we'd have to consider things about God like he is utterly loyal that he is consistent and that he is steadfastness that's what we think about when we think about it. he is utterly reliable the fact that whatever God says he will do we would remember some of the things that's taken place in Scripture. What God has said, they would, these things would come to our mind when we say God is faithful. We're speaking about the accomplishments of His own purpose. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. You see, you, you think about these things and His faithfulness, His faithfulness to do it. It works both ways. We learned that too. It works both ways. That God does what He says. It means all men are accountable to Him. It means if you're not paying attention, if you're not paying attention, you could be in the wrong place. You see, because God is faithful. God told Moses, stand back. Separate yourselves from this congregation. Now I may consume them in a moment. You see, before Aaron could get out there with the sense to make atonement, 14,700 people died. You see, God is faithful. And uh, that's being on the downside, though, of God's faithfulness. God is faithful. Uh, it, can, it can swing in either direction, you see, because He, he can rely on what He says. Uh, you can be on the upswing with God as well. God is faithful. There are two sides, in other words, to God's faithfulness. There's a, uh, there's a left side and there's a right side. Both sides are just as faithful as the other one. On the right side is fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. Uh, they're on His right hand, His right side. And depart from me, I never do you. Now, that's on this left hand. If you find yourself on this left hand, and the side is faithful, excuse me. In this regard, <clears throat> you can know that God is faithful. You can believe what He says. I will do it. <laughs> well, God, This is the way God thinks. This is the way He speaks. I will do it. The new man speaks this way too. Matter of fact, that's one of the ways we know that when the new man has spoken, when those things that have been said come to pass, when well, we know the new man must have been talking. God is faithful. <clears throat> now again, how's this worked out really? How do we, what's the practical side of this, that God is faithful? How do we deserve it? Well, God told man not to eat from a certain tree. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, we know that they did eat, and that death has reigned upon the earth. He is faithful. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. Neither will I spare. Neither will I repent. When the congregation refused to take the promised land, we remember that dreadful word in, in Numbers 14, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, He said, Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Now we can we could take God as his record. Yeah. We can take it as face value. What I mean by that is uh, we can we can consider the implications of that God always does what He says He will do. That means we can look in the past and we can take what we know of God and we can apply it in the future. How about let's apply it to a scripture like Revelations in 2015, for, uh, yeah, 2015, for example. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I mean, you, ha you, have, to, you have to look at it that way. It's just that... That kind of thing. Since God is able, and He always does what He says, then we can expect that kind of thing to happen so we can base our, ourselves on this. So we're talking about God who is faithful. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. So God is faithful in all things, brethren. He is not unrighteous to forget. Amen. Rather, He is faithful to remember. Mm -hmm. You can see how the faithfulness of God works both ways. That God is always doing what He says. Benefits of, of God, because of what He says, they're sure to come of us. A, a God who is full of blessing, one who's he, God is like He's sitting on ready mm -hmm. to bless. That's His, that's his, uh, that's his, his desire is to bless. If God declares to you something like, 
surely in blessings I will bless thee, then you can take this word and you can live in regard to it. And the results from living this way in itself becomes a blessing, you see. Because we will not waver, will we? And we will grow strong in faith because our expectation is in a God who is faithful. When the Scriptures say God will pour out His blessings, now men immediately stick out their hands, don't they? You know, but see, now the humble and contrite heart, they open up their minds and their hearts to God. And, they, and, they, and they, with the expectation, they look for the blessing. The benefits of living unto a faithful God. If you're like Peter... Now, here's the benefits of living unto a faithful God. If you're like Peter, you can lie between two soldiers, chained between two soldiers, possible execution the next day, Mm -hmm. and you do not fear. Mm -hmm. No matter what happens, you believe the promise of of Christ, of His provision and care. He can live. You can live in regard to them no matter what. You can, matter of fact, you can be like Peter. You can sleep so good at night that an angel had to come along and wake him up, prod him awake. You're able to live this way because you know our God is faithful. He, he does what He says He's going to do. He is faithful to see us to the uttermost extent. <clears throat> and then we, can, we give testimony in this room to that. This is how, that's how we, should, we could look at this verse. Now, if we were just going to consider that phrase, God is faithful. This is a general, like a general statement of it. But that's not how Paul is, is using it here. There's a more, more than Paul is speaking to the saints, number one. He's speaking to the saints. Keep that on. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son through Jesus Christ the Lord. That statement is connected to verse 8. Matter of fact, verse 9, you understand, is used to really to, to uh, uh, support and strengthen verse 8. Add credibility, if you will, to verse 8. <clears throat> The thinking is like this. God shall confirm you unto the end because He is faithful Amen. that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this verse, Paul extends the meaning of this by stating God is faithful. So, he, so he's underscored it. All of this, but God is faithful. God is the one by whom you were called and by whom you were placed into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So now God done it. Paul is telling them that the work of God began when He put us into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, He will confirm it to the end. This is a powerful word. It has a, a sense. It, it has a sound of completion to it, doesn't it? And, it's, and a sound of something final taking place. Uh, it brings to mind, to me, and I wanted to stick this in here, use it, of Romans 12, 29, because it has such a complete and, and final sound to it. I, I want to look at Romans eleven twenty nine. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Okay, for God's and you have to look at it. That for God's gifts and calling never change according to His faithfulness, because you know the word called, which He uses there. He's uh, He uses the word called in Romans, and He actually says placed. And, and, and so this, it's God's actually doing these things. He's calling and He's placing. And you know the word called. Uh, is, which is using it's a very special word. Brother Gibbon talked about this in, uh, uh, this week. Uh, it's a very special word, and it's mainly special because God used it. He, the calling is made special when it's God who's doing the calling. Uh, the calling itself it gains a, a, a significance and means something. It's important because God is calling. He sanctified the word. Uh, to have a better meaning than how we use it commonly today. It's another word that belongs to the saints. It's another word that belongs to the elect. The word is a verb. We use it all the time like that. But the way the Scriptures use it most often, it's a noun. It's the call, the call of God. And those called of God are always the saints. There's a lot of calling in the Scriptures. We know this. God's calling men. God's calling all kinds of things. God, we talked about God calls. God will call. And we will answer. And so, and, and what they all have in common is that they always come. That we will answer. That's what it has when God calls. How can you believe that God has an eternal purpose if you don't believe a God does what He wants to do? Like when He calls, things come. God raises up men. Now, in a sense, uh, there's not a man who li- alive who can raise himself up. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not that way. Uh, in the Scriptures, everybody in the Scriptures know this. This is assumed. 
that every man owns his existence and his everything to God. They had an awareness of God. Men do not act, and in Scriptures, men do not in, act independently of God. They just don't. God's always involved in their thing. God raises all men up. And, and out of that number, though, He calls men. Yes. This call, the gospel message, it goes out to men everywhere. And the Lord depicts this very thing. He gives us a way to put it, actually put our hands on it. He uh, is uh, the parable of the landowner. Remember, he went out five times in one day and calling men to work in his vineyard. And those who heard him went out to the field, reported to the foreman for work. Those who did not go, they did not work in the vineyard that day. Okay? They didn't go. They didn't work. They didn't get paid either. Pause. We ask, why did they not go? Why, why didn't they go? Uh, is it that they did not hear? Is that what it was? Well, no, that's not it. Romans 10, 15 says, yes, they heard, the sound, yes, they heard their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. So they, they heard. All that ever, and the Lord gives us a look at this. He, he says this, and all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. And ye believe, and ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. Yeah, that's right. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So, that's the reason that men call, come when they call, because they hear this this calling, which has been for them to hear. That means they come and they follow in this verse, mm -hmm. wherever he goes. They follow, so it means more than. Coming, doesn't it, when they call? It means that we follow too. It means we, we, we come and we follow. We, we stay at it. Actually, we should say uh, now, we follow Him wherever He is gone. It's wherever He goes, wherever He is gone, because the Lord has gone. He is it's past tense. So we follow Him to that place where He is now. He is calling us from there to come to Him. He is there already. He is there in glory, and He continues to beckon us on, and He's calling us, which I want to emphasize the fact that it involves following after we hear the call. And so we follow Him, the glory, and He is, be sure He's leading us out of this world. We want to follow after the Lord. As I said earlier, in a sense, God raises all men up. Matter of fact, not in a sense. God does. He raises all men up and according to His purpose. But in the Scripture, the elect of God are called. Yeah. And uh, all other men are raised up. Uh, God would say to Egypt, for this purpose I have raised thee up. And then Paul says, he, he tells the saints right here in our, in our text, up in the second verse, uh, he would say that he was sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Now, the purpose of God in, in, uh, in His election, it makes salvation a sure thing. Only for those He confirms until the end. Uh, but the main point to make here is responding to the hearing of the Lord. It includes coming and following. God confirms the saints. God is faithful to do this. Now, in regard to this, uh, God is faithful to confirm the saints. Paul has, it seems like Paul has taken a certain frame of mind. Uh, it's re kind of reflected here in, in the Corinthian letter, both, both letters. Uh, <clears throat> and it goes like this, that God's going to confirm the saints. He's, God is faithful to do this until it was shown to him otherwise. Talking about Paul until he had a reason to think differently about the situation, Paul considers all those who have responded to the gospel, he considers them all call of God to the fellowship of Jesus Christ. That is God who is working salvation upon the face of the earth. Now this is, this, is a, this is a marvelous thing and a wonderful thing. Particularly so though, when we have reached our own limits. When we've done all we can do, we've said all we can say, and, we, and, and all we've left to is, is our prayers to the Lord. So in salvation and confirming the saints, it is God who is transforming them into His image. God said, I will do it. 
That's one thing we can say here in, in, the, in these two letters. Paul wasn't in any hurry. He wasn't in any hurry to give up on the saints, was he? Uh, he wasn't in any hurry to give up on the brethren. But, you know, now Paul, he doesn't hesitate. On the other side, on the other hand, Paul didn't hesitate at the facts. When the situation was made known to him, when it was made known to Paul, he could say, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Paul knew T Demas was out. He left the work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can look and see how Paul dealt with the fornicator. Mm -hmm. Paul knew he was out. Paul knew he was out. He called him a wicked person. And that's the reason he told the brethren, get him out. Because he knew the man was out. Yeah. And the truth, which we saw in, in, in our Genesis lesson, and Abraham was pointed out to us. It's a vivid, a vivid illustration. We saw it with Abraham. We also saw it with Sarah as well. It's not over until the trial is over. We certainly can't come up to any final conclusions until the work of God is done. So God is in charge of these trials. And, and, and this goes with God is confirming His salvation among the brethren. For God's past benefits, what He's done in the past, they, they, ought, to off, they ought to offer up to us a hope, uh, a good hope for one another in regard to what He's done in the past. We should have a good hope then as to the future for the brethren based on what God has done. Amen. You know, uh, the contrast is given before us that God is faithful. And it's a very important thing then for to, to see that the saints uh, need to be confirmed. Mm -hmm. And it, well, it is an important thing to see yeah. because God wouldn't be doing it then, would He, if it wasn't necessary and essential. He would call men into this work, actually, otherwise, if it wasn't something. He, Barnabas wouldn't have had to go to Antioch mm -hmm. uh, and exhort the saints. You know, when that first thing they heard, when uh, the, 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 they received the gospel message at Antioch, well, then they sent their best man down you know, and, uh, to exhort them and uh, uh, to, to establish them in, the, in what they have heard. The brethren understood the nature of salvation and what's at stake. They knew all too well uh, the work of the devil. Hey, he knew how the devil would use influential and, and ambitious self-seekers to go in there and turn the attention off of Christ to the work that they were doing. So they don't going to let this happen. They're going to go down there and establish and confirm the saint. God's using the brethren to do this. Uh, they, weren't sitting, they weren't willing to sit back and let this happen. They sent Barnabas down there. The Scriptures teach and the testimony of the saints <clears throat> confirm this. We will face many hardships in order to enter the kingdom of God. But it's God who is at work, brethren, to confirm us. Actually, in verse 6, you know, Paul uh, says that uh, the, the work of confirmation had already begun in them. He says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So God had already began to confirm them. And then in verse 9, three verses later, Paul says, He'll do it until the end. And uh, <clears throat> He is faithful to confirm those He has called unto the end. Our blameless state will be a confirmation that God has worked, will be blameless and accusation-free to the Thessalonians. And I pray, Paul said, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it and until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Speaking to the saints, Peter says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So you got, we got God working His established too many times we got God very, very uh, uh, active working among us. And, and this faithfulness of God, you know, we want it to be found in us. We want it to be seen in us and recognized. We want to be like that too. We, uh, we can't rely on the flesh to do this. God doesn't rely on it. You know, the flesh is hopeless. Hopelessly selfish and unreliable. When people are relying on the flesh, we're going in the opposite direction. We've been born again in the likeness of Christ. Uh, we've been given the Lord's nature in order that we may do this very thing. We uh, talked about it this week, and it, it occurred to me that you know, certain things would just hit you. 
But the life that we've been given, that divine nature, is a resurrected life. A resurrection life. Uh, you don't hear it talked about it. We hear a lot of eternal life. But a resurrection life is given with the eternity in mind, you see. It, uh, and this life, this life has eternity in mind. It's the way it thinks. It think, it's thinking forever, you see. <clears throat> we ask ourselves from time to time, do we desire this kind of thing? I, we need to ask ourselves, does this kind of talk sound good to me? Yeah. Well, I hope it does, and I, I'm confident it does. And, and, and that, do we desire this thing more than anything? Well, <clears throat> because you must understand that once we've called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, then comes the work of being made blameless. So we, we, we wintered in. Now, we have this idea, and we bring it up quite a bit. Now, I, I love it when brethren bring it up. I like to think about it on my own. Isaiah 51, 1. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock hence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. We make a reference uh, to the work of God a lot, like a quarry in a pit. Uh, a place where God is confirming and proving men. It's a place of salvation. Uh, we use the idea of the quarry a stone quarry, okay? <clears throat> this is where a lot of hard work takes place in a quarry. Uh, to do, uh, and it's, and, and, and it's, it's, it's right that we think of a stone quarry when we think of salvation because it's a, it's a lot of hard work. Takes something to be obtained in the quarry. Paul was in fellowship with the Lord when he had this report to make. He was actually in the quarry when he said things. Troubled on every side. Uh, pressed out of measure. Perplexed persecuted, cast down, the spirit of life. He was in the quarry. You see, God was working. The quarry is a pit from where the stones are retrieved. They're cut right there. It's also the most common place for the work of cutting and shaping to be taken, for it to take place right there also. It made sense, you see, to cut and fit the stones right there on the spot. It reduced having to handle that stone so many times needlessly. So they dug, they cut it there, they fit it there, and they moved it one more time. They set it in place. See, they did, they were going... If you want to know what the core looks like, brethren, just look around you. Just look around you. You are currently in the most principal tooling shop right now. This is where in the assembly, this is where the attention to detail is made. If there's any kind of fine engravements well, on the stone that's needed to be made, it would be made in the assembly. And the pot, fire polishing, things like that, be done. Out in, the, out in the world, in the fellowship of Christ, there's some heart, there's some big chunk to be chipped away there and things like that. But in the, in the fellowship, uh, <clears throat> it's a little bit different. There's intense focus there. In the fellowship of the Lord, really, that's the place of the quarry, though. We don't want to make any mistake about that. Paul says unto the fellowship of Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's the quarry. While we're under His protection and care, we are work in progress. God's work. <clears throat> we don't want to leave the quarry. Don't want to leave the quarry. Even though some of the hardest work known to man, literally, is done right there in the pit. Called the most wonderful work it's done by the Lord in that place uh, within some of the most difficult circumstances. We talked about circumstances. You know, this is the Word of God, the promise to confirm the saints unto the end. It is attached to the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Now, he's attached it there, Paul did. It's where God's placed us. <clears throat> we should not think that this work which takes place in us is going to be done without our participation and involvement then. We must be involved. Our natures were changed so that we could be involved and so we could participate. <clears throat> Our transformation is a real thing. <clears throat> it's, it is it's a cognitive change. That means I can know it. I can know the change. Uh, and, and, and that is it's, it's us who's been changed. It requires our involvement then. Our, and our understanding of the change that actually we're helping bring about. Salvation is not a formula or something like we'd use in, in a lab or, or in our mathematics class, it's, but it's a living thing. It's alive. It, we were born again. We were made alive unto God, and it requires a living faith, a living hope, a pure heart, a cleansed conscience, and, it, and, and peace and assurance before God. Does, now, men can know that these things are present uh, in them and, and when they're not when they're not we can stay after it until they are known Amen. knowing knowing all the while see <clears throat> that God is faithful yeah. Amen. 
So just so that man don't get the wrong idea, though. Paul's got uh, so, uh, so the man don't get the wrong idea, and to underscore the liability of men in this area, uh, Paul tells the brethren some other things in the end of chapter nine. A lot, you know, uh, we have this thing that God will confirm you no matter what thing. A lot of people will teach this so that men don't get this wrong idea. Paul, he's going to say, and let the record of God speak for itself, in other words. And he begins with him, Paul begins with himself, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And then in chapter 10, right the next thing over, Paul makes a parallel to the present day followers of the Lord to those who were delivered from Egypt. The Israelites, they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They ate and drank spiritually from rock that followed them, that rock being Christ, verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And then he goes on to say, these were things for our examples. And the same thing that has happened to us, the work of confirming, it depends on you staying with Jesus Christ. We don't have